Welcome back, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third session of Event Talk Live. This is our Event Talk with the Experts panel discussion. And we're really excited to have some amazing event experts here with us today to talk about their experiences with booking top talent and the best speakers for their events. Um, hosting the panel discussion today is Alyssa Zingaro, my colleague from Excel Events. Um, and I will hand it over to her now. Take it away, Alyssa. Thanks, Maddie. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great Thursday. It's been a good day so far over here on our end, and I'm excited to kick off this panel discussion. So joining me today, we have Shauna Arnott, we have Carlette Hewitt, and we have Deanna Wosu. So I would like you guys all to introduce yourselves and just give the audience watching just a brief, you know, how you got started in the event industry and just what you do. Perfect. Go I'll jump in. Yeah, go ahead, Carla. <laughs> okay. Hi. Sure. I'm Carla Hewitt. I'm the owner and founder of a brand and events management agency, the Per Point Group. Uh, I've been planning events since probably my 10th birthday party. So I've been in the event industry for a number of years. Uh, professionally, I started in events in 2015, and I've been in events ever since then. So nice to be here. Awesome. Deanna or Deanna? Sure. Hey, I'm Deanna. I uh, started in the events industry in about 2007. Originally, I worked for a trade association, so I started on the nonprofit side, and then I moved over to corporate work, which I did for about the last six years. Uh, and I've also dabbled a little bit in some work on the venue side, uh, food and beverage, as well as working uh, with the designer uh, on the event design side. So. Now, uh, as of March of this year, I'm an uh, independent event strategist, uh, and I have my own company called Deanna Camille, and I'm glad to be here. It's great to have you. Hi, everyone. I'm Shauna, and I'm the founder of Moby Events and the creator of Haste and Hustle, and I've been in the events industry for about 10 years, and um, I plan exclusively corporate and, um, corporate style events and think tanks and retreats, that type of thing. And um, I don't know, it's just been such a, an amazing road. And I've loved even seeing how it's shifted into um, virtual events in the past year, especially. And uh, so, yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you. So I want to start off by asking, and I know um, our audience is probably wondering the same thing. What are some of the best tactics and strategies that you use to seek out the right speakers for your event? So if you could tell us a little bit about your recruiting process, and this question is open to everyone. So whoever wants to go for it, just jump right in. Sure, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, I typically like to start with the personality of my attendees and really understanding the personas of the people that will be at the event. Um, what I find is that style is kind of more important than content because in the speaker space, what I see is there's a lot of repetitive content. So unless you're dealing with like an SME in a really technical or a niche space, um, especially in like the motivational or just business leadership, there's a lot of repetitive content, which is fine. But style is really where I focus my energy and my attention because not every speaker will fit every group right? Just the content is not plug and play. Um, some groups are more formal. Some groups are a little more informal. Um, so you can't put someone that's going to be in a suit and tie and using, you know, SAT words in front of them and vice versa. You wouldn't want to put someone like a Joe Rogan in front of, you know, a board of directors where everyone's very formal and they don't use any for profanity or something like that. So I really lean heavily on the style of the speaker, now, the process has run the gamut. Like I said, I've done the association and corporate side. So I've been involved in call, formal call for speakers programs where you open it and you get applications. And then I've been on the other side where it's literally the stakeholders give me some content points and then I have to go out and do like the Google search. Um, so that's what I look for. Um, once I know that the content is what I'm looking for, I look at the style and will this style of the speaker fit the group that um, I'm matching them up with. Got it. Carla. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Oh, sorry. Do you mind? If no, I, go ahead, go I just ahead. would love to like reiterate. I, I do the same thing. I really look at the um, the attendee first and figure out. Um, and I mentioned this in my fireside, you know, I really look at what they're trying to get out of the event and what I want them to get out of the event and what I want them to learn, how I want them to connect and all those things. 
and then I go out and find the speakers that fit that that um, the, the 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 attendee sorry and uh, and make sure that we're aligning really well and and I love the idea of you know what you said um, Deanna about the style it is very important to consider the style and the the communication tactics used and 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 whatnot I remember having a speaker at my first Haste and Hustle event and Haste and Hustle is a very like edgy sort of scrappy fun entrepreneurship event for young people and I had a speaker who was an an incredible woman entrepreneur in Canada a, you know, a leader in her in her industry, but she was very formal, and she stood up there at a podium, and she had a PowerPoint, and it was very staid, and it was one of the you know talks that just got you know kind of poo pooed a little bit, you know, even though her content was really good, it didn't because she didn't communicate it in a style that worked for that audience. So I think that's very important. So I just kind of wanted to reiterate that it, I, I agree with you, Diana, about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice. I, I think I kind of take a little bit of a different approach than uh, Deanna and Shauna. Uh, for me, I always start with budget in mind when vetting speakers. Um, a lot of the clients that I support, sometimes they want, you know, the grade A speaker and then there's no budget. <laughs> and so I kind of work backwards, um, of course, keeping the attendees in mind, but also letting my clients know, hey, you know, what's the budget? Is there an honorarium that we're going to offer? Is there some sort of incentive for the speaker? And then also considering the demographic of the speakers as well. So um, I echo what both Diana and Shauna said, but keeping budget at top of mind when sourcing speakers, for sure. Mm -hmm. Harlan, I wish more speakers gave a range of their budget. So when we're doing that research, we can narrow them out on the front end, right? <laughs> uh, very true, very true. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> I, I have a question. I want to go back to, Deanna, what you said about style. Do you think, like, say you have a speaker in mind that you really want, right? And it may that speaker's style may not necessarily match the audience. Do you think it's possible for them to morph their style to the audience? Um, and change it based on the event and the audience? Or do you try to kind of avoid that completely? I think there's a difference between um, their style and kind of like their swagger and their personality and content delivery, right? So you could have a workshop, you could have a lecture, you could have um, a case study or a panel discussion. So Obviously, you can always have one speaker deliver the same content in a lot of different ways, right? They could do a half-day workshop that's really more intensive and more hands-on, or they could do a one-hour lecture, or it could be, you know, a think tank where everyone is, you know, sourcing ideas together. Um, but I just don't think you can put a, a square peg into a round hole. So if someone is super informal and, you know, fly by night or kind of flighty or whatever their personality may be, you're not going to really get them kind of more conservative and vice versa. So um, I think sometimes if you have them tweak the, the, the delivery mechanism, that may meet your attendees needs. So maybe they're used to really doing things in a lecture format and their content's great. They're a good fit, but your attendees really need more hands-on, they need more engagement. So you can work with that speaker to kind of create those engagement ideas that it could be more than like Shauna said with her speaker, a someone standing at a podium with a PowerPoint and that just doesn't serve that group. So I think that's where you could do it with the delivery method, not mm -hmm. necessarily their style. Got it. Yeah, I think I think I 100% agree with that. It's like whatever environment you're in, you kind of adapt to. So if the speaker's used to being at the podium rather than a round table, you know, they're going to act a lot differently in each scenario. So I really, I really like that and agree with that. Switching gears a little bit, Shauna, I want to ask you, who was the first major name that you ever booked? Um, Cause I know you have a few big ones and tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah. So it was Gary Vaynerchuk. It was um, 2016. And um, I, I, I hope I'm not being repetitive because in my fireside, I did chat a little bit about this and I can talk okay. a little bit about him and um, maybe one other as well, just to elaborate. But um, I, I, I was booking him for the first Taste and Hustle and I really wanted to have him come because I was booking it in Niagara and in Niagara in Canada, it's a wine region. It's also a very unique business region because it's because it's because of its proximity to the border and opportunity zones. So um, I 
I, I, I managed to book him through a impassioned plea and <laughs> to his agent and, you know, you know, outlining all the ways I saw the alignments and the potential for him to, you know, you know, bust into the Canadian market. Cause at, the, at that time he wasn't nearly as big as he is now. Um, but he was still pretty popular, but mostly in the U S so it was sort of like, I, I kind of pitched that to him almost like as a sales pitch and, um, and it worked. So he, he was my first major speaker. I still don't, I think I was a little crazy when I did it cause I didn't even have any money to book him. Um, and it was still going to be, <laughs> his fee was very significant. Um, but we managed to, you know, pay it and do, <laughs> do everything. All right. But then, um, the, the next year, um, because we end, I actually ended up taking a huge financial hit on that event because it was the first one and, you know, all those lessons that you learn in that first one, he ended up um, finding out that I took a financial hit and, um, you know, said to me that he would come back and do a second event with me for free. Oh, wow. And yeah, so then he ended up being my second major speaker <laughs> that I booked. Um, and then we, we sort of work together and he helped me promote it and we um earned back you know most of the money that we'd lost and and uh did another incredible event and that was just really cool so it worked out um it worked out even though it was a bit of a gamble right from that's the get-go awesome. <laughs> yeah. i think that's a testament too to you know the relationships that you build with the speakers that you are booking maybe even the speakers that you reach out to and maybe it couldn't work out but that relationship that you have with them is so important because you never know down the line, um, you know, what events you're going to be, you know, organizing, what you might want to reach out to them for. So I think that's awesome and really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Deanna, so you say that out of the thousands of speaker pitchers that you've received, you only have hired less than 1% of them. So I wanted to ask you, what is your process for narrowing down those applications? Like you said, it would be great if, you know, speakers gave their price, a price range up front for you to narrow down. But how do you narrow down so many applications? Well, the funny thing is the majority of these are unsolicited pitches. So that's the number one thing. So the, most of those end up in my inbox trash just because they're not a fit. Nine times out of 10, those unsolicited emails are people that are doing the spray and pray method, just blasting as many as they can. And you can tell that it's not even personalized. They haven't looked at your group and they don't fit. And, and that that's okay, but um, I'm not gonna waste my time on someone that unsolicited sent me um, a sales pitch and they're not really a fit for my business and my, my attendees. Uh, but of those that are a fit, whether it's through a call for speakers process or a referral from someone or you know all the different methods that you can find a speaker. I tried to ask like a basic list of questions and those questions were gonna kind of vary on the group. So it'll be either related to the content, to their delivery style, like how do you typically deliver a message? Um, this is the theme of the event this year. Could you tweak one of your presentations to kind of fit in line with that? Whatever, I have that list of questions and I'll give it to, if I've got a list of 10 that I wanna deep dive into, I'll give it to all of them. And then I gauge their responsiveness some are better than others in terms of getting back to you right away. And anyone that's managed speakers, you know that that's probably the number one issue that planners have with speakers is their sometimes non-responsiveness when you need materials from them, whether it's their PowerPoint or their headshot and bio so you can promote the event. So if they're not responsive in the sales process, they definitely won't be <laughs> in the delivery process. Um, and I look for how thorough they are in their response. Are they just kind of giving me a copy and paste answer, or are they actually looking at what I'm asking them and saying, yes, based on your question, here's the service that I can provide and you know, giving me some detail there. And just their overall customer service, because if they're, again, if they're tough to deal with in the sales process, they definitely won't be easier to deal with after that contract is signed. So I do not, I don't do diva speakers, unless it's, you know, the stakeholders have come in and said, we're hiring the speaker, just do all the logistics and do it. Well, okay, then, you know, you have no choice. It's, it is what it is. But if I am the first line of filtering speakers to get to the stakeholders, anyone that's tough to deal with immediately comes out of the pile. So that's my kind of quick, fast and dirty on um, uh, kind of uh, whittling the list down, if you will. Got it. 
Yeah, it's a tough task. <laughs> Definitely. And I, and I think it, you know, could be harsh, but you're exactly right. You know, you want, you know, you could, there's only so much that you can control when it comes to organizing your event and the speakers and their attitudes and whether or not they show up and are on time and are engaging, like that's really out of your control. So it is so important to try and identify those red flags when you are trying to sort through your list and, and just getting those people who are interested, don't really care out. And that will make your life a whole lot easier down the road. Yeah, absolutely. It can sometimes be an issue of working with the, um, the, your client, you know, like mo most of my events, aside from Haste and Hustle are client based. So they have their own ideas of who they want as speakers. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's sort of like people they know or people they've seen or this, that, and the other. And I find it's sort of like, you have to say to them, okay, let's, let's make a strategy. Let's vet each one. Um, I just got hired to do an event. All the speakers have already been brought on and I'm like, oh my goodness, like, you know, have you researched all these people? And, um, you know, have you left space? I always say to planners and, and, um, people organizing events, uh, the, the clients leave a couple of spaces um, to close to the end because oftentimes right before your event, you'll get some like really interesting requests from um, bigger name people who want to come in maybe at a much lower rate or for free sometimes. So there's, you know, some strategy around booking those speakers and vetting them out. Mm -hmm. And, and, and managing your client and, and keeping them from getting too excited. Because often people want to be like, yeah, I want to offer all my friends space on the stage or all my colleagues, right? And it doesn't always work. It has to be the right people, so. Right, right. To I Shauna's point, not to Shauna, Deanna's point, you made me laugh when you said you don't do diva speakers. <laughs> I deal with so many divas on a daily, mm -hmm. and not, I don't necessarily liaise with the speakers directly. I often deal with their PR teams and their agencies, and they can be divas. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in that instance, you don't really have a choice, right? <laughs> so I um, <laughs> totally feel you uh, when you say you don't do the divas. It, it definitely makes your job a lot easier when you can eliminate that stress that you don't need. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you, Carla. Oh, absolutely. I, I filter them out. But if it's dictated to me, then I grin and bear it. <laughs> what are you going to do? And you're right. It often is the the people that surround the speaker. The speaker themselves aren't always the divas. It's the yeah. PR teams that have this sort of inflated ego because they work for someone well known, right? And it's like, come on, like let's just have a conversation here. <laughs> I find it so annoying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What I've run into in terms of the two problems is the diva mentality, or on the other hand, if they have an assistant or an agent or something that they're working with. They may just not be on their P's and Q's and they're not super responsive, but mm -hmm. it's not the speaker because they're that intermediary. It's their job to communicate with me and get me the deliverables I need. Um, I had a situation. Actually, this was just a few months ago when I'm still in my full time job, um, a speaker that I was looking through their their assistant. And every time I sent an email, it would take two or three days to get a response. And the response would ask me a question that I answered in the previous email. So, you know, people that are just not, you know, super organized and coordinated. And it's like, this is your job to keep that person organized. My, my God, how, I hope you're doing better than you are with your, you know, <laughs> dealing with me. <laughs> I agree. Mm -hmm. Carlette. So I, I know you talked a little about a little bit about budget um, earlier. So when you're working with clients that have, large scale events, like what factors or how do you help them decide which speakers and contributors that would be best for their audience? So, you know, maybe they have a, you know, a specific person in mind, or maybe they don't. How do you have to go and pitch the speaker that you would like to them? How, how does that work? How do you do that process? I don't usually have to pitch the speakers. I again, I liaise a lot with PR teams and, and agencies. And so it's just a matter of knowing which agencies to kind of contact for the speakers that you want. Typically, in my case, clients will bring me their agendas or an idea of what the agenda is. And then we'll just slate in speakers who are, you know, qualified to have that discussion for the demographic. Um, I don't I don't really have any any trouble with that. Um, again, just reverse engineering. Do you have a budget? This is how we start every conversation. Uh, organizers tend to want a lot for very little, right, mm -hmm. respectively. But we know as event professionals, if you want the Gary B's, et cetera, et cetera, as Shauna mentioned earlier, and everybody always wants 
those guys, right? They're equally as as amazing speakers who are very well qualified to have the same conversations as Gary Vee and the like um, for way lesser, you know, budgeting. Mm -hmm. So I think just keeping that in mind and knowing who to go to, um, I definitely tap into my network, extended network, and now I'm happy to have Deanna and Sean in my network. <laughs> you know, everywhere um, else, hopefully, the event. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but it's really important, like you said earlier, to uh, nurture relationships, even with the PR teams and the assistants, et cetera, because you just never know who you're going to have to go back to based on budget restrictions, et cetera, for other speakers in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. <laughs> I, I actually got that advice after my first event, and it was that, you know, it's it's good to have a headliner who can, you know, attract the attention of an audience if you're selling tickets for it, but mm -hmm. the ultimate to feed your audience with information and content that is meaningful to them, right? And that's where, um, and, and so you're right, there's a ton of speakers out there that can provide equally, if not better, um, content and content delivery, they just may not have the, the facial, the, the, the recognition, the popularity, but they're still great speakers. So I always, I, I always try to have like at least one person who can kind of, you know, attract the audience to the event because they're famous or whatever, but all my other speakers are just hand selected because they're absolute experts. They're great speakers. They're, you know, aligned with the, the topics and, you know, whatever. But, you know, I think that's a great point that you made, Carla. Let's talk about the the big name speakers for a second. So do you rely on speakers who have a big name to kind of get the word out about the event for you? How do you help? I guess this is a, a multifaceted question. Um, that would be the first question. And then how do you help your speakers to promote themselves leading up to, to your event? Um, do you provide them with some sort of pack, you know, package materials that they can um, you know, promote on their social channels, or are you kind of letting the bigger names just bring in, you know, that they're going to bring in their audience. And is that maybe also that's kind of like a pitch of why you want them to speak at, at your event? I would love to chime in on this. Go for uh, it. I think the biggest misconception is hiring a headliner to sell your tickets or to bring guests mm -hmm. to your event. It is, it is false. Uh, I, I want to say that again, like it is false. Without a strategy, there has to be a strategy for the event, headliner or not. Um, I've seen it where, you know, clients have spent thousands of dollars for a headliner and then have that headliner not even promote the event. They show up, they do their thing, but it wasn't clearly outlined in the contract what the expectations of the speaker was, you know what I mean? And so I think it's really important for organizers to know if you're putting on an event, please have a strategy as to why you're having this event and why you're bringing in this headliner and or any of your speakers. Um, don't rely on your speakers to promote the event unless it is clearly outlined in the contract. Um, that's part one of your question. And then part two is definitely work. I work with my clients to make sure we outline some sort of marketing strategy, um, obviously leveraging social media platforms that they're on, and then also their extensive networks tapping into their speakers. I think pre-event and post-event activity are really important when you're developing that strategy. Um, just even with uh, the speaker contracts, right? Getting your speakers involved in the pre-event, and post-event activity is important. Just because the event is over doesn't mean the event is over. In fact, the event just begins when the event is over, right? So um, I think just clearly outlining a strategy and not relying on speakers, headliners or not, is how you sell tickets. Mm -hmm. Cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that the hard way. <laughs> well, I will and, say uh, this. I have never booked a widely recognized speaker. I booked five-figure speakers, but not people, not people that are, you know, name brands like a Gary V or a Lisa Nichols or anything like that. Um, and I totally agree. And even as an attendee coming to an event, nine times out of 10, some of these headliners that are at these event industry events are not what are, what are drawing me. I'm drawn by the breakout sessions because those are the ones where I'm actually going to learn some content for my business. I'm drawn by uh, the attendee list because I see who I can network with at that event. I'm drawn by the location because I can park on a vacation on the location. If I can tack a vacation on the back end of this event, then that the event is more appealing to me. So I think as event organizers, we have to think about what is our attendees motivation for coming. And then when we're creating those, those 
that content and the things that we're going to sell, like uh, to Carlette's point about the marketing strategy, it speaks to all those reasons of why they're coming. We're not just booking a headliner because we're expecting them to fill seats. We're booking a headliner because our attendees have really craved this headliner's uh, content and our attendees are following this headliner on social media and are really engaged with their content. And this headliner is also going to do three social posts. They're going to do a mini webinar prior. Like it has to all be inc all inclusive and all touch points are, are cohesive and not just, well, we booked, you know, Sting. Okay. No one cares. You know, if you, especially if it's a Gen Z event, no one really cares. <laughs> That's a really that's a really good point. Um, I think that you know it might even though the name might be as big to you know a lot of people, but it just matters if the name is big to the people at your event. Like I'm in marketing, right? So I know a bunch of different thought leaders in marketing and um, just a bunch of different people. That if I said their name, like I don't think anyone else would probably know their name, but I know their name and they're a big deal to me. So it's important. It just, I think it always goes back to that point of knowing your audience and knowing them really, really well. And if you know your audience, you'll be able to attract the right speaker for them. And then hopefully that will lead to a successful event. Yeah. If I can just speak to the second part of your question, you know, about how to get speakers to help you promote, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, major names, like for me, Richard Branson doesn't do any promotion of my event. Um, we, you know, use his likeness to kind of attract people to a certain degree, but it's the, you know, lesser well-known speakers that we really, you know, activate to help support the promotion. And so we make it very simple. You know, we create a, you know, a Dropbox or a Google Drive with all the images and some sample text that you know they can just easily access to create promotions um, we usually also create images that show them with you know our well-known speaker because it makes you know there's a little bit of vanity there that we you know <laughs> try to tie into and um, and you know we really activate you know those speakers to help support but the key to getting them to do that is to kind of ride them a little bit you know you have to kind of be checking in because that is something we always put in our their contracts but it's also sort of the last thing on their minds so i always am kind of checking in hey have you posted this please tag us you know um so we we have to you have to really kind of be on top of people to make sure they're actually doing it Sure. That was a great point, Shauna, mm -hmm. providing them with all the assets in advance. It makes their job so much more mm -hmm. uh, easier. It's easier to do. And, and you guys, even with putting this event together, you guys made it very seamless for us, right? So kudos to you all for taking the initiative to do that. Um, and I think just it speaks to the level of professionalism from any event organizer, how organized you actually are with um, providing your speakers uh, all of the assets that they need in advance of the event. Yeah. And I want to um, just add, sometimes you have speakers who um, maybe they have a full-time role and they do speaking as, you know, because they're showing off research or they, it's part of their job because they're in sales. So they aren't really a professional speaker in terms of getting paid for it or what they're getting paid is a small honorarium or travel uh, reimbursement. For those type of speakers, you definitely want to give even more legwork to them and, and be more of a support. So I would even recommend either, you know, scheduling Zoom sessions with them where you can interview them and then take that interview and splice it and create, you know, small video snippets that you can put on your social media. Like give them, make the road as short as possible for getting the content you want out of them. Because if they're not a professional speaker on the level that they're getting thousands of dollars for an engagement or that they're doing this, you know, five times a month, those things, it's, it's just going to be a much higher hill for them to climb because it's not in their everyday activities. Whereas those who are doing this for a living and, you know, they're commanding, you know, four, five, six figures, that's, they usually have a team that's helping with them, helping them yeah. with them too. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, really good point. So I have to ask, <laughs> um, what, what are the major differences that you all have seen between booking and prepping speakers for in-person events versus booking and prepping speakers for now virtual events? This is a good one. Go for it. Go for it, Deanna. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, 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 an interesting take on it just because I taught online for about three years. 
Um, mm -hmm. I was doing ESL teaching online and that was kind of like my little side hustle when I was working full time. So I was used to delivering content on a computer and, you know, talking to a camera, teaching children, you know, through a screen. So I was actually kind of shocked how difficult it was for a lot of speakers to translate in person to virtual and learn how to present to uh, an eight by 10 screen and a little dot camera lens. Um, I didn't realize that, like I said earlier, the hill to climb would be so high for some of them to, to make that adaptation. I think some of them were able to, to make the transition relatively quickly in terms of getting all their equipment, but the equipment is the easy part, right? The actual delivery and, you know, when you can't, some people love walking around a stage and they might like walking up to the attendees and kind of being up close in person, um, or maybe they're passing out handouts and doing, you know, really hands-on activities and they don't know how to translate that through a screen. So really it almost comes about more to like curriculum design and, and, and online facilitation. So those are the things I think some speakers that are really good in person, but maybe not so good virtually, they need some support in terms of how do you create a presentation to deliver to a virtual audience? Not just, is your lighting good? Are you in the frame? Do you have a good you have a green screen, screen share? Like that's pretty, if you don't have that together by May of 2021, you really shouldn't be doing public speaking, but um, it's more so the delivery and, and giving content through a screen some people just aren't good at it. So it's kind of, they need that professional development and help with the changing of the delivery style. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is hard and it is different. You know, you're taking speakers that are used to, you know, presenting or engaging in an in-person audience of hundreds of people. And then all of a sudden it's like, just me, just me and my laptop. And so it, it is difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. You're right. It's been it's been a whole year, a little bit over a year, so um, it's, it's time to to get with it. I think, right? <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see as more events are doing the virtual. I mean, the hybrid. You know, over the next few months, the next you know, Q three, Q four of this year, how speakers deal with that. So I'm speaking at WEC in June, but um, even though it's a digital and an in person event, it's the content delivery is basically separate. So I'm gonna be speaking one time to the digital audience and a totally separate time to the in-person audience. So from that standpoint, I don't know if you wanna call it hybrid, um, but if the speaker's ever in a situation where they're talking to people in the room and people through a screen, um, that adds a whole nother layer of complexity, obviously. Right, right. Carlette, did you have any differences on what you found to be the same or more difficult when, when booking and, um, and prepping for virtual? Sure. As someone who specializes in virtual, virtual and hybrid events, um, it, there's definitely a learning curve. Um, I've experienced experienced speakers have tech trouble, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they think they know this already. I know this already. I don't have to show up for your tech walkthroughs because mm -hmm. I know how to turn on my camera. And then you get to the day of the event the camera doesn't turn on. And you're like, you know, this could have all been prevented had you just showed up to the tech walkthrough. Um, I am a big caveat for showing up for your tech walkthroughs, push it for your clients. Your assistant cannot attend on your behalf. You have to attend the tech walkthrough. We need to see you, you know what I mean? I, I need to see you there with your camera on. I need to check your audio. We need to check your camera levels, everything, firewalls, et cetera, you name it. I have experienced it through the last year and a half. Um, it's very important to show up for your tech walkthroughs and whether it's live and or virtual, I, I highly suggest everybody show up for walkthroughs and preparation. You can never be too prepared, especially in a virtual world because every moment is accounted for and anything can go wrong at any time and you want to be prepared for it. So I'm a big advocate for tech walkthroughs. I don't care how long you've been speaking. I don't care if you're a $50,000 speaker, you will show up for my walkthrough. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you bake into the speaker contract that attendance is mandatory? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the, a lot of the clients that I work with are very senior in media and entertainment, and we don't have any room. <laughs> we just don't have any room uh, for these tech situations. And believe me, it happens, right? It could happen on Zoom and it could happen on any platform, um, but you just want to make sure 
prevention is better than cure, right? I'm a big believer in that. You want to make sure you show up. Hey, if we if we tested it and something happens on the day of, at least we're prepared on how to kind of, you know, work around it as quickly as possible. But if you don't show up, I don't know what computer you're on. I don't know what your cameras look like. Or if you show up to the tech walkthrough on one device and then the day of the event, you decide to log in from your cell phone in your car. <laughs> It might right. not work. <laughs> <laughs> Things happen. And so again, just I, I definitely bake it into the contract. We reiterate it, we test, we schedule. And it's a very important part of virtual and live events as well. Got it. Yeah. All right. So I think that's it for my questions, but I do want to um, dive into the audience QA. So I can kick that off. Um, so Jen is asking, does anyone have any ad advice for newer speakers as far as how they can win business without a ton of speaking experience? Yeah, pitch yourself. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. pitch yourself. There's, there's, there's tons of opportunities for you to get on stages. Um, I'm a big advocate for LinkedIn. Please go over to LinkedIn, get in some of those LinkedIn groups. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of Clubhouse. Go on Clubhouse, practice, practice, and pitch. You know, um, if you do some research, you can connect to event organizers, assistants, make relationships with the assistants. They can put you in position to be on these stages. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just a big, uh, I'm a big fan of putting yourself in position to win, right? And the only way to do that is to raise your hand and let people know what the topics are that you specialize in and, and what you'd like to contribute to their event about. Mm -hmm. Have a speaker reel, have a media kit, get all your brand assets professionally organized and put it out there. Yeah. And I always say, you know, I, I've always been an advocate for practicing. You know, there's so many, you know, community groups and different places you can go and speak for free, you know, and just kind of just to get out on a stage and get familiar with audience engagement and all those things. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly there's just so, so much out there if you're willing to kind of exactly as you say, put yourself out there. And, um, and yeah, take the time to put together, you know, uh, at least a proper one sheet. Um, if you have the resources, you know, a decent website with, you know, some um, something. And, you know, the moment you have the opportunity to speak in public at a decent event, try to get the reel for it and, and create some kind of um, visual video asset, because that's certainly I know that's how I do all my research, I need to see a reel. Yep. Mm -hmm. I would also add, in addition to what Carlette and Shauna have said, don't be afraid to host your own events. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sometimes you can't get booked at an event, but no one can stop you from speaking at your own. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, it could be as simple as a clubhouse room, which is really simple. Don't overlook the value of Instagram lives, LinkedIn lives, Facebook lives, like all that is the same, especially when you're talking about getting booked for virtual events, it's the same thing. So yeah. just display your services constantly and then proximity. So what are the type of events that you want to be booked at? And are you finding the people that work at those types of events? So whether it's the association market or the Smurf market or corporate, or even just learning more about the events industry to kind of finding your niche, right? Um, I think once you get the proximity to those people who are in it, and then you give your you have your visibility really high, then it just comes with the territory. So don't be afraid to host your own things and make sure you're close to the people that are actually organizing. Yeah, I, I, I often tell people. Said. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I love what she said. I love what Deanna said. Create your own stage. Like, yeah. bingo. The best way to do that is just show up consistently. Pick a platform, show up consistently. People, The people that you're targeting will see you, and that's how opportunities will eventually create themselves. I think that's fantastic, Deanna. Good advice. Yeah, yeah thank you. you. And I always tell people to try and join industry associations. So, um, you know, because people ask me this all the time. I'm like, join MPI, join, you know, the the meeting planners groups, the event planner groups, PCMA, whatever it looks like, and start interacting. Because once you start getting engaged, and that ties in exactly with what you're saying, you know, you want to be around the people that are doing the hiring for, you know, for these events. So... If, if you are active in those groups, just like Clubhouse, like people will start to recognize you and you're getting practice, right? So I know Deanna from Clubhouse and I just recognized her little profile picture every time we were in a room together and we would acknowledge each other. And that's one way to build a relationship where 
you know, you're putting yourself out there, but you might not be really putting yourself out there. So I definitely recommend that and just be involved. And, and also one other thing is to follow people on LinkedIn. And a lot of times um, if you're trying to get booked and these event organizers, they put out a lot of really good content geared specifically to you on LinkedIn. And so if you follow them and interact, you know, that in itself is building a relationship right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think we all agree, don't mass email blast with your pitches. <laughs> Spray and pray does not get you very far. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, let's see. I think we have a few more questions. Tony is asking, do you recommend having a separate digital and live event or just live stream the live event or does it matter? So I think this is not specifically a speaker question, but still relevant. Um, Does anyone want to take that one? I can chime in. Um, So again, virtual events have been around for years, right? It's not day, it isn't new. Um, I think for someone who's interested in doing both, which is the now termed hybrid, uh, just make sure you have the proper tech team to support your event. Um, It can all be done. I just did a really complex event last Friday. Uh, We had remote speakers, we had live speakers in a studio, we had a live video broadcasting in Los Angeles. We had some speakers remote in studio on screen, live speakers on screen, ah, it was crazy. And so we had two tech teams in order to make sure we were able to cover that, a studio team and then a a live streaming team. So I just think, make sure you hire professionals. If you wanna DIY, give yourself enough time to practice and test. Um, but definitely make sure you have the right tech team and know the platforms that you're utilizing for your hybrid events. Not all events platforms are good for hybrid. You know what I mean? You want to make sure you do your due diligence, make sure you have the right technology um, partners and the right tech team to support your event, but it can all be done. Yeah, I think to piggyback on that, um, if you don't have that support, whether from a budget standpoint or from a staffing standpoint, you don't have that. Think outside the box in terms of your delivery method. So does it have to be live streamed? Could you just record it on site and package the recording on online? Um, so that's something I had suggested in my previous role because we didn't have the staffing support for me to manage a, lar- a live event with 300 attendees and also stream off site to clients. That just, we didn't have the support, we didn't have enough hands. And so I said to my management team, well, can we just hire um, an AV crew to record and capture all the content? And then later we can disseminate it and create an online page for it to live. And then it's two separate projects. Um, So just think about the delivery method. Does it have to be live at the same time too? It could be where the online content is not delivered at the same time as the in-person content. So just think outside the box in terms of the delivery method um, if you do want it, you know, to to be both in-person and online. Mm-hmm. I agree. All right. I think we have one more before we wrap up. So what are some ways you've seen speakers engage attendees virtually in a creative way? Mm. I'll chime in there. I just love personally when speakers find a way to have the audience be part of the content. So it could be where you phrase a question to the audience and what you deliver in the the following portion of your of your presentation is based on what the audience has given you kind of like a lot of comedians will do with improv right they'll be like give me a word and then they create you know a little scenario based off the audience's word so maybe it's you ask for an example from the audience of a work scenario and then you take that work scenario and apply it to the leadership principle that you're teaching so have the audience help you with the content they're creating um, and get that buy-in from them early that will keep their attention all the way through because they're going to look for additional points where you're going to give them an opportunity to add to the conversation and i think Mm -hmm. along with that giving them kind of nuggets or previews like you know i'm gonna you know i want to dive into this topic but we'll get to that later or, you know, finding ways, you know, to keep their attention, keep them on edge, um, keep the suspense going. Yeah. Yeah, we've done a lot, you know, using Twitter and having conversations with um, speakers in advance where they'll like ask questions and get people to start chiming in on um, content they want to, you know, hear or learn about from that speaker. Um, we do a lot of video and pre-video with 
almost like what you're saying, little nuggets of, you know, what they're going to talk about, um, tips and tricks and, you know, sort of some um, samples of what they're going to learn about. And um, I know Gary, for my second event, he did, um, he was launching his shoe the same day as the event. So we did um, a, a big, huge um, promotion around that. And we had a contest and people could, you know, get into the contest in order to attend like a pre shoe launch event right before the conference. And, you know, so there was some, I mean, that's sort of a big budget item, but which they kind of handled and I just contributed to. Um, but it was really fun and it got people super, super stoked for our event as well as his. And I loved that collaboration because it became a huge win for both of us. I would add um, leveraging Clubhouse. I've, I've incorporated Clubhouse into pretty much all of my uh, virtual event activations as much as I can. Um, I am a big advocate for Clubhouse mm -hmm. chats <laughs> leading up to the event, post event, during event. Pre like it's great for engagement. Um, if you're looking for an added element on how to keep, you know, how to keep your audience engaged, you can literally you know, engage in a chat while the event is happening live. It's great. Um, I also am a big fan of Instagram lives leading up to the event. Again, post and for and during event as well. I think that that's a really great way to continue engagement. Um, having Instagram chats, um, having client throw up some social media content and then engaging the audience in a chat with a giveaway, like Shauna said. Um, people love tangible items. So something that they can actually, you know, feel, touch, taste. Um, for someone who's doing, you know, want to really tap into marketing, sending wow kits in advance of the event, getting everybody to talk about the uh, the items included in the wow kits leading up to the event and then having uh, a promotional strategy as a part of the event. That's another way to keep everybody engaged. There's so many things that you can do. Um, like Deanna said, you know, think outside of the box, be super creative. There, there are no rules. Like all the rules are out of the window. So you can literally do whatever you want um, and keep it fun. Just always lead with the audience in mind and the budget. <laughs> yeah, Carla, along with your idea about the um, the wow boxes, mm -hmm. I was on a clubhouse room and I think it was with Shay Wheat and she was talking about an event that she coordinated where the swag boxes that they sent were not just swag boxes, but there were items that they were told they were told to open at specific times because it connected with the content yeah. they were do, doing live at the event. And I just thought that was so um like awesome because it's a physical, like to your point, a physical tangible item, but it's also building that momentum. Like they're getting excited. They're getting reasons to log in live because a lot of times, especially with free events, they may be excited to register. And then when the day to day comes, they've forgotten about it. But um, so make sure that they're physically present and it keeps them tied to the, the content as well. So um, there's tons of ways. We're just giving you kind of scratching the surface of mm -hmm. how to get their attention and then hold it throughout yeah. that time. Yeah, exactly. Very I cool. Heard, yeah, I've heard of swag boxes or wow boxes. I haven't heard that term yet, but I haven't heard of someone doing that, you know, open, you know, open this part of it during the first session. And that's really awesome. I have not heard that. So definitely gonna, gonna walk away with that one. So Very cool. We're just about out of time, but I want everyone to kind of leave their final thoughts to wrap up our event talk live today, booking the best. It could be a piece of advice. It could be your favorite quote. It could be whatever you want to leave our audience with. Now is the time to do it. I'll jump off. Um, my advice to event organizers, think looking at the chat might be a mix of speakers and organizers, but just think of the five senses when you're creating these experiences for your attendees um, and, and think with their mindset. What is it that they are looking to come to that event for? And then when you're booking your speakers, your vendors, whoever, make sure you're thinking with them in mind and not yourself. You're not planning an event for you, you're planning it for your audience and just make sure that they have that holistic experience that, you know, touches all five senses. And then for those who are speakers, just get to know some event organizers. Proximity is going to be your best friend um, and just show your stuff as often as you, as often as possibly you possibly can. Mm -hmm. 
My advice is to always be considering, obviously always consider the uh, attendee first. I think we've all agreed on that, but considering the energy in the room for the event, um, most of mine are live, um, but even on a virtual event, always consider the energy that a, that a speaker brings. So, you know, you want to have some that are going to get everyone super excited, but you also want to have some people who are going to kind of fill in those times where you need to kind of have almost like a little bit of an emotional break. And, you know, you want to have a good flow to your day energetically and, you know, really thinking through, you know, where you're placing your speakers in the lineup and the flow of content and the energetic flow, I think is um, something that a lot of people don't consider, but it is very, very important. My advice is, this is easy. It's PPP. <laughs> PPP. Everybody's talking about PPP, right? But it's to plan pre-event, during event and post event. You need a plan. You need a plan. You have to have a plan. I've seen uh, organizers all too often venture into creating events with no true strategy. I am a huge advocate of hiring professionals. Okay. Hire a pro. Even if you don't hire a pro to plan your entire event, book a strategy session. So you at least know, know what you're planning to do leading up to your event. Uh, yeah. And that's my, that's my advice. Awesome. Thank you all so, so much. Maddie has rejoined us. They're going to um, leave some remarks, but it was great to speak with all of you and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Everyone. Thanks so much, Alyssa. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of our panelists, Carlette, Deanna, Shauna. It was wonderful to hear all of your insights. Um, I learned a lot of really valuable things. Uh, I hope everyone else did as well. Um, now that we have wrapped up all of, our, all of our sessions, we're going to start our networking portion of the event. You can network two different ways, actually three different ways. If you don't wanna be on video or use your audio, you can continue to network in the chat attendees by clicking on the people tab in the main menu. Um, you can also do speed networking through our one-on-one uh, -on -one networking session, which comes up um, if you click networking in the main menu. And finally, you can join one of our lounges, which is a group video networking uh, feature. And that is also accessible in the main menu on the left-hand side of the page. And if you have any questions or any comments about Excel events, you can drop into the Excel events info booth in the virtual expo hall. Um, and as always, thank you again for attending Event Talk Live, and we'll see you next month for the next edition of Event Talk Live. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you.